You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Welcome back to Thrive. In today's episode, I'm having a conversation with heart surgeon, associate professor of surgery, and new author, Dr. Brian Lima. Dr. Lima's bio is extensive and impressive. He has published nearly 80 articles in peer-reviewed medical journals and has presented at numerous national and international medical conferences. He's the surgical director of heart transplantation at North Shore University Hospital and helped launch the first and only heart transplant program on Long Island. Dr. Lima did his undergraduate degree at Cornell, received a Dean's Full Tuition Scholarship to attend Duke University's School of Medicine, spent a year at Harvard Medical School's Transplantation Biology Research Center, has received awards in cardiovascular surgery, and he can now add book author to his resume. So all that to say, I am so excited to have a heart-to-heart conversation, pun intended, with Dr. Lima today on Thrive. Be sure to stay tuned through this episode, drop us thoughts on social media, and without further ado, welcome Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of heart puns, so that was, uh, <laughs> that was perfect. 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 Uh, Brian, before diving in, I've got to tell you, I know it might not seem it since you perform life-saving operations every day and I talk to people on the internet for a living, but we have something in common. We were Mm -hmm. both high school valedictorians and Ivy League graduates, and we both have books coming out in 2020. So getting right to it, give us your story, maybe your professional background, but also some personal background that really brought you to where you are today. Great, thank you. Um, my story is uh, is not unusual, but unique uh, in its own way in the sense that uh, it's a testament to what's possible if you really truly apply yourself. Uh, nothing is really out of bounds, and uh, my story is a testament to that. I grew up in a uh, Cuban immigrant home, uh, working class, sort of blue collar family in New Jersey and really had no role models to speak of with regards to kind of professional aspirations. Uh, But uh, what I learned, which uh, looking back now and and is is such a was such a huge lesson was the power of work ethic and not giving up. And that really propelled me forward uh, to where I am today. It's uh, been a long road, but it's been this stepwise, you know, one Um, uh, acquiring one skill leads to the next skill leads to the next experience and it's like this building block type of experience where uh, if you would have told me growing up that um, I would become a heart surgeon I would have thought you were nuts you know I just felt like that was uh, how how, that's impossible you have to you you have to be special to do that you have to be brilliant you have to uh, be able to you have to have skill uh, technical skill yeah and all those things aren't really necessarily 100% true in that it, it's a process. It's putting in the hours, putting in the time. Uh, and I, I sacrificed basically my 20s and in large part my 30s to achieve that goal. And uh, looking back on it, I can't believe I did it, <laughs> but it's possible and I'm proud of uh, what I've been able to do. As you should be. I know you mentioned your parents were immigrants and you had to really fight the odds, so to speak, to become, I mean, one of the country's top heart transplant surgeons, which is incredible. You're really living the American dream there. Um, And I know you and I both had working class parents growing up too. So how did your family play a role in helping to kind of get you on the path that led you to where you are today? Were they supportive of your aspirations growing up? Do you think that was really kind of formative to how how you became what you are today? Absolutely. Uh, I can't credit my family enough, uh, my parents in particular, because we certainly didn't have the financial, you know, profile or portfolio to, you know, think of uh, aspiring to 
great, amazing things at elite universities or things like that. But they gave me the courage, you know. So in essence, I, I I hit the lottery with my family because I had loving parents that believed in me. And I think that is, in in many instances, all you need uh, mm-hmm. for kids today. Having that one person, or is it a teacher or a parent, someone in the family that actually believes in you and gives you that confidence, that positive feedback that, you know, hey, just don't quit. Keep at it. You could do it. Uh, I had that. And unfortunately, I don't know, um, a lot of kids don't have that. And I think that was a huge, huge advantage that I had. Yeah. Did you always know that you wanted to be a surgeon? No, uh, it wasn't. I had this inkling that I was very interested in medicine. It it meshed well with my interest, my natural interest in science. Uh, But it wasn't until I actually watched the surgery when I was in college, I was able to do a program where they let me into the operating room and watch. And it's one of those things where, because I have people that ask, you know, hey, can I come watch you do an operation? I'm sure, I said, you're either gonna pass out when I start opening the (laughs) chest, or you're gonna think it's like the greatest thing ever. And for me, it was like the greatest thing ever. it's, it's, a, it's a, there's no in between, I'd say. And that was the case uh, for me. I saw it and love, was love at first sight. And I was like, I want to do that. No, you know, I don't care how long it takes, but I want to do that. And uh, that's how it all started. See, that's awesome. And I think I would be in the pass out category. So that's why, <laughs> that's why yeah. I talk to people on the internet and stuff, <laughs> instead of yeah. operate so, on people. So, it's okay. It's, you know, some people are all wired differently. So it's just important to know how you're wired. That's all. <laughs> so what, what for you then is the most like personally fulfilling thing about being a cardiac surgeon, especially over any other type of surgery? Was it kind of a process to narrow in on heart or was that always something that was the most interesting to you? Uh, it was a combination of both in that uh, I loved all surgery, but it really was the challenge uh, of heart surgery. The I just really had a, a fondness for the, the dexterity, just watching uh, these master surgeons do heart surgery, how their hands would move, and the sutures were so delicate, and you have a moving target, you know, being the heart, and it's it's just amazing to watch. And then you see uh, in the case of heart transplant or even routine, if there is such a thing, heart surgery, where you have the heart stopped during the duration, you know, you're doing whatever procedure you had in mind, fixing this, replacing that. And then you reinvigorate the heart at the end of what you're doing, or if you've put a new heart in and just seeing a heart spontaneously just start beating again, that to me, (laughs) it never gets old. It's magic. And so that's the part that that it's sort of that mystical aspect of it that uh, I was just totally enamored with it. And to this day, it's an exhilarating feeling when you've completed an operation and you know you've literally saved this person's life and completely transformed their day-to-day existence and given them more time with their family. That uh, it, it's it's what I, why I do what I do. Wow, I have goosebumps listening to that and wish that I had the uh, the chutzpah to to do that because I can't imagine how incredible that must feel. <laughs> it's an incredible feeling. It's uh, I, I wish everyone could feel that about what they do. Um, yeah. I don't honestly believe it's specific to what I do. I think if you you search long enough, you, you everyone can find something they're genuinely passionate about. Mm-hmm. So I know in your book, which I am so excited to talk about in a hot sec, but you have a rule, it's all in or no win. So that if something is truly your calling in life, it's likely not going to be easy to achieve. So what would you say to listeners who might be struggling trying to discern their calling in life? Uh, Maybe trying to figure out if something really is this meaningful, bigger than you thing for their lives versus more of maybe a passing ambition or a short-term aspiration? There's a couple ways that I would answer that. Uh, I start with my specific example, and I uh, pretty regularly have students uh, or trainees ask me about a career in heart surgery. Uh, What are the pros and cons? Would I recommend it? And my usual response is something to the effect of, well, if you need me to convince you of why you should become a heart surgeon, then you probably should not become a heart surgeon. Uh, I think uh, 
in whatever capacity, in whatever area of life, what whatever field somebody is engaged in, that thing that they're working on or they're aspiring to, in my opinion, has to be something that it's a no questions asked deal, meaning there's, they can't not see themselves doing that thing that they're mm-hmm. aspiring for. It's got to be, uh, unless it's that, then I think you haven't found it yet, which is totally fine. Uh, it, it, it's The world has a way of showing you those things with time, and it may just not be your time yet. But the, the, the corollary to that is be sure that you're leaving yourself open and receptive to getting that message, to finding that calling, and not wasting your time, uh, especially these days, being distracted with stuff that's not making you better or not or counterproductive. And not to bash social media, but, but things like the distractions that are, you know, taking you away from your mission or from making you better at uh, health wise, intellect wise, um, all those things can maybe prevent you from finding what that calling is. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just think so many people, there's so much going on in the world today. So many, we're, we're flooded with these images. Um, on our handhelds every day that I think clouds our judgment and keeps us distracted from the the true mission at hand. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. It reminds me of something that a guest said, I think it was episode 13 of Thrive, Chelsea, where she was talking about um, that sometimes in the period of wait, we end up wasting time. So I love that you really emphasized there how you're, you still have to actively live your life. Even if you feel like you're waiting for something to, come to you and that it's not like inspiration is going to just land on your head out of nowhere and hit you like a ton ton of bricks, but you still have to be putting the work in and actively pursuing things. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. (laughs) Exactly. It'll come, you know, things happen for a reason. I truly believe that. And uh, you just have to be open to the universe kind of showing you, Hey, this is, this is your calling. Um, You just, I've been trying to tell you, but you haven't been listening. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So top heart surgeon, professor, now author is on your resume. So what inspired you to write your new book, Heart to Beat? Uh, some of it I can explain rationally and some of it I can't. <laughs> so it, meaning that uh, it just was something that uh, just flowed out of me like a, like a stream of consciousness randomly. Uh, I've never had anything like this before happen to me in my life. And it was, you know, in the beginning of my surgical career, I was finished with training and it was just this flurry of ideas. that just kind of kept moving, uh, onto the, onto the page and it, it snowballed into all these things that I felt basically a, a summary of my story Uh, the lessons I learned along the way and how I felt all of that really could help other people. Uh, I feel so many people are, are really not tapping into their full potential. They're just kind of going through the motions and they're not living up to what, you know, had you asked them, what do you want to be when you grow up? When they're, you know, when they were little, they had all these amazing dreams and, and, and astronaut, this, that, the other. And somehow all that just got lost in the shuffle of uh, Mm. adulthood and, you know, it became impractical or, uh, well, you know, I don't want to risk, you know, being a risk averse. And I just feel like people have lost that edge. And I felt maybe my story could help spark uh, or you know, help people recapture that, that edge. I love that. So speaking of full potential, um, I want to share a quote from your book with listeners now, if that's all right. Um, because sure. I really love it. Uh, you said, we all have free will and we all have a choice. You can choose to live aimlessly, half-heartedly going with the flow and suppressing that inner voice, the one beckoning you to unleash your full potential and to grab the world by storm, or you can achieve success by committing to hard work and unceasing effort. I love that. So how did you go about tapping into your own full potential and really narrowing in your focus? And maybe what advice would you give to others that are trying to tap into their own full potential as well? Well, some of it we've touched on a little bit in that first and foremost, you have to know that uh, if it's really your calling, if it's really something that you're passionate about for the greater good, not just for your own personal benefit, uh, um, but really for the greater good of humanity, something that's really going to be worthwhile, it's going not going to be easy. It's not going to be an overnight thing. 
uh, you're really going to have to put a lot of yourself into it. And uh, along the way, in my own journey, there were many times where I felt like I had plateaued. Uh, whether it was, uh, oh, you know, I'm a pretty big deal. I graduated top of my class in high school. You know, I got to college and felt like the dumbest kid in the whole class. <laughs> and then that, that recurring theme of, wow, I'm not as smart or talented as I thought I was, all these people in this room arguably are much smarter and much more talented than I am. So I, it, it was this constant upping my game and uh, getting better than I thought I ever could be. Um, and so I think people really have a, a misconception about what their potential is, quote unquote. I think we're all capable of much more than we give ourselves credit for, but we psych ourselves out before even going down that road. We say, oh, I could never do that. There's no way. I could... Uh, I'm not, I'm not talented enough to do X or Y, and we just psych ourselves out. So I think number one, not limiting yourself, leaving yourself open to whatever it is that you're, you know, listening to that inner voice and not getting distracted by all the white noise <laughs> that we allow to enter our lives, especially today, um, and and just going after it, knowing it's not going to be easy, accepting that there's going to be some bumps along the way, failure is inevitable, but it's it's okay. We all do. Nobody ever makes it to the top without having stumbled along the way. It's just, there's no way around it. I'm curious too, since you're one of the first uh, male guests on the Thrive podcast, have you seen from your experience, especially being high up in the medical field, differences in how men versus women think of their full potential and see themselves as they're going rising through the ranks in a really competitive field or maybe in a very rigorous academic situation. Do you think mm -hmm. there's a difference there in how men versus women view their full potential? Well, I will say that in, in my own field of surgery, I have seen actually a very a, a comforting, uh, positive trend in that was what was historically, you could say, a male-dominated field has really uh, changed and uh, where I trained for surgery Duke which was you know considered one of these intense uh, age-old you know hierarchical rigorous places uh, they actually had I think it was maybe five years ago six the entire graduating chief resident class you know seven all were female <laughs> all were women oh. which is so cool uh, and in stark contrast you know, if you walk down the the hall of fame uh, of all the graduating residents from Duke over the years or 50 plus years, you know, it's, you know, white male, white male, white male, white male. And then all of a sudden you start to see different uh, ethnicities, different genders. And then, and uh, it's, so I think it's a welcome change, but uh, in that, in that vein, I would say that both men and women, especially if they have their eye on you know, similar callings, uh, if they're in the same boat, so to speak, because they're chasing that one calling, I would say in general, they, they share the same uh, insecurities. Um, I, I would say maybe women uh, in my field, in many fields, unfortunately, that have had that sort of legacy of being predominantly male, uh, you know, uh, uh, predominantly males in the past, maybe are fighting that that stereotype along the mm -hmm. way. Uh, you know, I have a lot of colleagues that uh, you know uh, are, are physicians, and they and unfortunately, I, I must say, they do get that a lot in the hospital. Working, they you know someone uh, they'll be mistaken for a nurse, so to speak, or uh, they won't be uh, given that same automatic out of the gates respect. And so I think women do sometimes uh, fee, uh, have to face those challenges more so than men. But uh, I tell you, I mean, every female physician, especially in surgery where I've had the, you know, the luxury of working with them uh, directly, uh, amazing, uh, amazing uh, people, very gifted and very driven. That's awesome. So speaking of drive, another gem from your book um, is you said, I don't have, you don't have to be the smartest or most talented person in the room to get ahead, just the one who wants it the most. And then you also say later on, you say your eagerness to move ahead contributes more to your success than natural talent or being born with a silver spoon. So what do you think that really looks like in someone's everyday life or work? I'm curious, if someone is sitting there listening and thinking, man, I do want it the most, 
is there anything they can do to kind of check themselves to ensure that they're really doing the work to make that happen so that they're not just wasting time wanting something without really working for it too? Sure. So one thing that technology, you know, I was trashing technology, but now, now I'm going to actually tout its, its virtues. So it affords everybody, it's an, it, even the playing field, because now uh, we all have access to technology and we all can vet out in whatever field we're in, who the goat is, the greatest of all time. Who is the, who is it that you, who's your role model? Who does it, you, who's your Michael Jordan, so to speak, of your field? And what did that person do? So it's this reverse engineering process, I call, and I refer to in the book, finding that, that, that archetype of, okay, this is what, this is what success looks like in my field. What did, how did they do it? What was their routine? And that's all available especially today. I mean, you can get that information. So that's one sort of objective way that you can get at that, that you're at what you're asking is, how do I know if I'm on track? Am I really putting in the work that I need to be? Well, you can quickly find out if once you find who that, that role model is, what they did, and you say, well, I'm definitely not working as hard as that person did. Uh, so I need to up my game, up my preparation. So that's one thing. Um, and number two, being honest with yourself and not to belabor the point, but really taking stock of how is it that you're spending your time? Uh, look at your, your day-to-day -day existence and how much of your time is spent with distractions, with things that really aren't contributing to the end result that, you want, that you're wanting to achieve. And I had it easy compared to today. You know, the youngsters of today, Anybody in all stages of their careers today have so infinitely more distractions than I had to endure. So it's a tough, it's a tough game today. Uh, there's a lot of stuff floating out there competing with your, with your mission. So uh, I don't envy folks today. It's, it's tough. It is a difficult process, but there's a way around it. You just have to be committed to it. Yeah, I wonder that often how the success stories of today are going to vary or how different they'll be compared to the most successful people from the time before technology really rose as big as it did and how much technology will have contributed then to the biggest success stories of today. I feel like it's going to be so interesting. <laughs> Yeah, because while so much has changed, there's a lot that's remained the same. There's still yeah. I, I I know people have poo pooed this, but I I believe you know in mass in ten thousand hours the mass you know rules of mastery putting in the time. There's you know, and ten thousand hours is ten thousand hours. You, mm -hmm. you know to be a great guitarist or or surgeon or X Y Z whatever it is, there there's no way around the repetitions. It's all about the reps. So. One way or another, you're going to have to get, it, get those in. So it's a, it's a time deal. Yeah. So what do you think is holding people back from massive success in life? If you had to pinpoint like one thing that's the, the, biggest, the biggest thing that's holding people back. I think it's a combination of fear of failure and wanting the, uh, the fast track where everything now is, is quick, convenient, at your, you know, technology uh, at your fingertips, success on demand. I think people are looking, you know, well, I, 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 that's great that you did all that, but I don't know if I want to spend that long doing that, or what if I fail? Everyone's going to know about it. I just don't know if I want to, you know, risk that. So I think it's the combination of the our fixation with instant gratification and fear of failure, uh, having to face judgment, having to face the consequences of what is essentially unavoidable no matter what endeavor it is there is no free lunch uh, you're gonna fail at some point you're gonna stumble and so and there's so many people out there that are so desperately afraid of stumbling or what you know, of what are people going to think about me if i if if i screw up or if i fail um but most people don't understand that it's inevitable and mm -hmm. embracing that and we're all in the same boat right it's not that some people are never going to fail so it's getting past that fear and also knowing that there is no shortcut. This is all, <laughs> there's only one way to get in those reps and it's time and effort. There is no fast track. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because going off of fear of failure, it's like, I heard it, I heard someone say one time that it's not that we are afraid of failing. It's that we're afraid of people seeing us fail. 
which is basically yeah. completely exacerbated by social media nowadays. But it's like, we all, it's so true. Like we all are kids and we grow up and we fail all the time and we fall down all the time and you just get back mm -hmm. up and try again and don't think twice. But it's like, we hit this point in our teenage years or in adulthood or whenever where all of a sudden fear of failure is such a crippling thing and can completely throw us off track. So it's, I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that really truly represents a major barrier for people. Um, they don't. Yeah. They'd, they'd rather not have to deal with uh, with what they perceive is going to be ridicule, or I told you so, or whatever that negative uh, feedback is going to be. Yeah, people are definitely afraid of that. So, how did you go about doing it yourself in terms of eliminating that fear of failure, or maybe? maybe silencing the, the should-haves, could-haves, would-haves that can hang out in the backs of our brains when we're making tough decisions, <laughs> um, especially since you're in such a high-stakes professional field where, I mean, failure can literally be tied to the loss of a life. So, I mean, did you have any personal mantras or practices or anything that really helped you eliminate self-doubts and those fears of failing along your journey? Right. So, um, that's a... There's a lot that, that I can get into with that. First and foremost, I don't have it figured out yet, uh, but we're all works in progress. We're all always figuring things out, getting better. And to me, that has been one of the most challenging things. I will say, though, that one, one, the best recipe for overcoming your fear of failure is getting so comfortable uh, with whatever that task is. You do it so many times, you get so, and it becomes second nature that you build confidence, whether in my case, it's it's surgery. So I practiced and practiced and practiced until I just uh, every waking moment that I could. So I built my confidence. I felt prepared. So I think being prepared and trusting in that process be, that you're you're ready. You ha that's step one. You have to really believe that you did everything you could to prepare and that that process is going to work for you. And then, you know, you're going to give your A game. You're going to do what you can. But like everything else, there's only so much you control you have over any given outcome. Uh, I, I I mentioned this in the book too. It's like you know life is an equation with a bunch of variables in it. We're just one part of that. But if we give a dominant performance and put in a lot of effort, then even though we're just one variable, that variable is going to have a lot to say about what that outcome is going to be. But mm -hmm. there's still other variables, right, in the equation. Uh, and certainly, if you don't give your best effort, uh, then you basically are introducing a fudge factor to your contribution. You're not giving as much. So your, out, your contribution is going to contribute less to the overall outcome. So I maintain my sanity by knowing and trusting that I'm prepared, continuing to do so, always striving to be better, and basically have, you know, taking peace and you know, being peaceful about the fact that no matter what happens, I know I did the best I could. And that's going to have to, that's just going to have to do, uh, because otherwise, uh, we, <laughs> most of us wouldn't really be able to function or, and, and I owe it to my patients, the next patient that's counting on me to save their life. I have to keep it together. Uh, and so I think that's the best advice I can give is just be prepared, be confident in your preparation and, uh, trust in the process and do your best and the rest will work itself out. I love that. Switching gears a little bit to medical advice, I guess, if there's any listeners out there who are aspiring heart surgeons or just aspiring to rise the ranks in the medical field at all, what advice would you give to them? Uh, well, they really should keep an open mind about what really moves them. Meaning uh, just because something is going to take longer to train to reach the final destination, uh, but it's the specialty you really like. What I mean by that is if you really felt like you were so into it when you were on a rotation in one area of medicine versus another, but you're, you're trying to justify to yourself, well, I don't know if I want to do that because it takes so much longer to finish. I want to be out sooner. So I'll, I'll go with this other area where I'm not as passionate about it. I think that's a huge mistake. So follow your passion, follow what really moves you and you can't go wrong. Time is a year here, a year there. You know, I trained for 10 years after medical school. Uh, it, it, time uh, is, is, should not be the reason why you, you don't chase your passion. Uh, 
um, and it'll it'll justify itself in the end. And number two, I think just like we've talked before, uh, identifying who that that role model is, who, who is the symbol of excellence in your field. What did they do? How did they reach um, their level of expertise and notoriety? Follow their plan, reverse engineer it into your preparation and into your career trajectory. So uh, that's another big, that's exactly what I did. I, I identified those people that, you know, signified, you know, the, the upper echelon of heart surgery and I basically retraced their steps and tried to duplicate it. For those people for yourself, were they people that you had access to in any way where you were able to reach out and contact them personally for help or for advice? Or did you kind of have more of like a passive mentorship role where you had to take to the internet and kind of put the pieces together yourself to adapt for your own life? I would say a combination of both. I was fortunate enough to have direct access to some of these individuals. Um, and so that largely drove where I decided to, for instance, do my heart surgery training. I wanted to, um, I ended up going to the Cleveland Clinic where uh, you have, it's the busiest heart hospital in the country. And so uh, I was able to witness firsthand and learn from these giants in the field, you know, directly how they do surgery how they went about preparing to become the surgeons that they are. So um, I was fortunate that I did have direct access, uh, but it was also at a time when really the internet wasn't as accessible as it is today, but uh, today that you could probably get those answers without having direct access to those individuals. Awesome. Okay, I have to ask this because I'm a big fan of The Good Doctor, <laughs> and maybe I've been a surgeon in another life if I wasn't sure. fan of the side of blood. So, what's been the most memorable case that you've worked on in your career so far, and why? And maybe what was one of the most challenging, too, that really felt like it was a personal victory to figure out? Right. Well, in, our, in my field, uh, most of the patients uh, we come across are older, meaning uh, heart disease, in many instances, not all, but most instances, you're dealing with someone who's in, the, in their latter years. And uh, in this particular case, in some cases like it, it was a young person, much younger, someone who is perfectly healthy, uh, 20s, in their, in their uh, mid-20s, who had the misfortune of having a, a cold you know, just a regular garden variety cold, but that virus, for whatever reason, decided to attack their heart, which mm. happens on occasion. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it's a known thing. And that could unfortunately lead to some pretty devastating damage to the heart, where we're basically in the throes of someone needing their heart replaced or having an artificial heart pump placed because their heart is just not doing anything. And it's your, there's just something about, because it's not the usual for me, for my field, having patients who are in the, so young, some of them, you know, with young children at home or parents just so concerned and it's just it adds this whole other layer of intensity and consternation and wow, this is, this has to go well. This is just uh what a tragedy. It's unbelievable that this young person has to be dealing with this. It's just so out of the ordinary for me. And uh, in one case in particular recently, uh, even though it was, it was a long haul over the course of a couple of months, but I was able to get her literally from death's door uh, where she was moments away from dying to, you know, getting a heart pump implanted in her. And now she was able to get engaged and uh, she's out in the world doing her thing and her heart looks like it's recovering. And, um, you know, that to me is like the ultimate success story because it, it would have been an unimaginable tragedy. And the fact that we were able to save her life and get her back to back on track, so to speak, with, with what you, you know, what girls her age do. And um, that's a huge one for me. That, that one really um, was uh, so impactful. Wow. Um, that, that one would have to be it, yeah. That's incredible. Did you, was there anything that you said to yourself to calm yourself down when you were going through that? Because I mean, just like you said, that's so intense and so challenging emotionally. How did you stay composed? I mean, I'm sure you're so practiced at this point, it might've been a piece of cake, but 
was that <laughs> kind of like mental routine that you have to kind of walk yourself through before you do something that is that monumental. Yeah, your mindset game has to be really on point. And uh, I like to believe mine is getting there. And one of the things I have trained myself to do is is basically it's the same way every time. I, I, I do heart surgery the same way every time. Uh, there's no VIP special instrument that, you know, it's not like if I have a, oh, this patient's a VIP. Can you give me my VIP instruments? So we're going <laughs> to, I do it the same, you know, and I think people let that whole VIP or no, this, this has to go well. Well, it always has to go well. Right. And it's yeah. the, the expectation is always that it has to go perfect. So I, ha, that's where, that's kind of my level of getting sane again. And, and, and like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, I'm going to do it the same way every time. There's no exceptions and uh, that's it and you kind of get away from well i gotta i better do this the different special way because that's how you choke that's how you you start to get cute and deviate from how you do things and that's when mistakes can happen so that's been my go-to strategy for for the things for situations like that that's awesome and what a great way to not psych yourself out of what you're what you've been practicing all those years yeah i i have all these uh numerous sports analogies in the book and one of them is like taking taking that game winning shot it's just a shot it's just like the shot you take in practice this is just because it's you know the whole championship is on the line doesn't make it's just a shot if you if you overthink it you're going to mess up and so that's the, the key here is not to overthink it yeah that's awesome so brian i want to close out by asking you something that i ask all of my guests who come on the thrive podcast and that is what does thrive mean to you and how do you strive to thrive in your own everyday life i thought you know that's a great question so when i think of thrive that to me it means making the most out of the circumstances that you're in day in day out making sure that each day you're making the best use of the time that you're you're allotted that you're not taking it for granted that you're using that time to somehow be better than you were the day before and to me that's what thriving is now thriving mate doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to uh, succeed uh, objectively succeed every day that you're going to make it, all your goals but in some way shape or form you are going to whether it's good or bad you're not going to let the circumstances of the day get you down you're going to you're going to persist uh, you're going to keep on trucking. You're going to stay with the plan and somehow, some way, figure out a way to get better. And I think that's what thriving means to me. I love that. And I couldn't agree more. <laughs> oh, awesome. Great minds think alike, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, Brian, where can people find you online and how can folks get their hands on a copy of Heart to Beat? Oh, great. So, uh, my website is www brianlimamd.com and uh, the book is available now for pre-order it's official it'll be officially released uh, February 18th but it will be it's available now on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and uh, any other bookstore online but uh, that that would be the easiest way awesome so everybody make sure you get a copy of heart to beat ASAP and Brian thank you so so much for coming on thrive and for sharing all of your oh my gosh endless wisdom with everyone today Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it so much having me on. Appreciate it. Wait, before you go, if you like what you just listened to, drop us five stars on iTunes. Make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. And if you're on Instagram, snap a screenshot and share to your story with what episode you're tuning into and tag me at Erica Legenza with what part resonated with you the most. That way I can see what's helping you and your friends can pick up a helpful tidbit too. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.